My name is Buster McLaurie. That's my wife, Cheryl. We live down at Paducah, Texas. Uh, we're both raised down that part of the country. It's a big ranch country down there. We're about, oh, 250 miles west and a little north of Fort Worth. Uh, uh, Paducah, just a little small town. We're, we're a little over 100 miles from any town of any size. So uh, we both, like I say, grew up in that country. And, and uh, I cowboyed all my life. My, my daddy was a cowboy. And, and both my granddads, and so we've uh, got quite a tradition of, of horsemanship uh, in the family. Uh, my daddy was was really a good horseman, and and so I learned a lot from him. And I was I was around some some good horsemen growing up. Uh, and some of those cowboys were really good hands with a horse. Uh, Keith Slover comes to mind. He he was a a really good cowboy and good hand, and he. He later on he trained some cutting horses and was real quiet with a horse and and, uh, and my daddy was good friends with Buster Welch and Matlock Rose and some of those guys and uh, Cheryl's dad was the same way he trained cutting horses for a lot of years so we, we got to know all those people and, and be around them some uh, so I, I grew up I started the first coat when I was 11 years old and it, it was kind of a rough and tumble affair. We didn't know much about getting the horse ready to do anything, so I learned how to tie one's foot up. Well, we staked him to start with. And learned how to tie his foot up and kind of manhandle him around. And, and through the years, I got pretty good at that. And I got to, to getting along with young horses pretty good. Um, so by the time I was 25 years old, I was, I was I think pretty good cowboy and, and a pretty good hand with the horse. I rode some pretty good horses, and uh, uh, Cheryl and I were married. And I thought we was getting along pretty good. I was working for the four sixes at the time, and, and uh, of course they raised pretty good horses. So, uh, and we had a lot of cattle to work, so we got to ride and use them a lot. So I thought I was riding pretty good horses, and then they hired this fellow to come help us start a bunch of colts one summer, named Ray Hunt, and uh, you know how. Ignorance is. I didn't know anything about Ray. I'd heard of him. The only thing I knew about him was that he went around the country and put on clinics. And I'd heard that they rode them colts the first time with nothing on their head. Well, that, all that sounded like a bunch of bull to me because I thought, well, if he goes around these towns and does clinics, then uh, people are bringing horses that are raised around the barn, the backyard, and whatever. You know, anybody get along with them anyway. And uh, that riding them with nothing on their head, I knew that was bull, because they'd been telling me since I was a little kid, if you're gonna live, you better get a hold of that booger. And the way we handled them, that was literally true. You kinda had to get a hold there. It's kind of a survival of the fittest deal, a lot of times. So I was pretty skeptical of Ray, but anyway, I was at least open-minded enough to, to watch and, and listen a little bit. And uh, about halfway through the first day, I didn't know what that fella had with a horse, but I knew he had something I wanted. So I really perked my ears up there and tried to pay attention and listen. Of course, it was all new. I didn't know anything about getting a horse ready. He talked a lot about getting him ready. And uh, well, those colts we were starting, they, they'd maybe been, you'd call it halter broke. They'd been handled a little bit, but they weren't gentle. You couldn't just walk up and catch one. So, so we'd run one in the round pen, and Ray would rope him and work him around our horse back a little bit. And I don't remember what he'd done, but it was all new, you know, kind of Greek to me anyway. And then he'd, he'd whirl him around our horseback a little bit, and then he'd get off a foot until he had his rope on him. He'd kind of sack him out with a cord of his rope. And, and when he thought he was ready, he'd tell someone to bring their saddle, and they'd bring the saddle in. And they'd just pitch his cord of his rope off out there and just saddle that thing up. And the biggest part of them just stood right there in them tracks. I couldn't believe it. I watched him saddle. 15, 18 head of horses, and he never tied up a foot, he never hobbled none, he never choked any down. I just, darn the thing I ever saw. <laughs> so when it come time to saddle mine, I carried my saddle in there, and, and I was I was long toward the end, because this colt I was, had picked, well, he kind of liked to stay away from people quite a bit, so he was one of the last ones to come in there. So I carried my saddle in, and I asked Ray, I said, say, I said, do you mind if I saddle this one, you kind of coach me? I'd like to learn a little more about this. And you could tell he's pretty skeptical as well. He said, I kind of like to do it myself the first time and kind of keep him out of trouble. And that helps for later on. But he says, your horse, if you want to saddle him, just be about it. So he's sitting on our horseback and he hands me his rope. 
So now just ease up to him and pet him. So I'm kind of easing down this rope. I'm, you know, I've been to a jillion of them that snub to a post or another horse or something. Kind of got to be careful sometimes they jump and paw at you. So I kind of ease up there and I get up pretty close and I kind of reach to touch him on the nose and he turns his head away. Well, that's not too unusual. A lot of them you can't pet them on the face to start with. So I kind of ease around back towards his shoulder a little bit so it's not quite so easy for him to paw me. I didn't just reach up and touch him. I knew better than that, but I kind of asked permission and looked like I could. I kind of just patted him a little bit. Oh, he just kind of flinched and stepped back and Ray said, oh, hell, boy, you don't even know how to pet a horse. <laughs> and I'm, I thought, I looked back over my shoulder. I thought maybe I'd misunderstood him, but I hadn't. He comes riding up there. He said, now think. He said, you didn't do anything but scare him. You see him flinch? And I didn't say nothing. I thought, well, hell, I'll do start with him. So what? You know? He rides up there and he said, now think. It's the first thing that horse ever felt in his life. Mm -hmm. He rode a, run his hand down that horse's mane. He said he felt his mama's tongue licking him off. She didn't take her tongue go banging on him like that. So maybe that's not a very good place to start. I said, oh. So, so I had a lot of things to unlearn. <laughs> I had a, a world of experience doing things a different way. But when, when Ray got to explaining why the horse was were doing what they were doing, why they were afraid, and how to work with that instead of working against it, Man, things went to getting better in a hurry because I could, I didn't just forget everything I knew before, but I used that experience I'd had to build on and, and help the horse and break it down in little smaller steps. And, and then I, I, I knew what a horse could do to you if he was afraid of you. So I had a lot of respect for the horse in, in that manner. And then seeing learning from Ray how to work through those things where he didn't feel like he needed to defend himself that way. Man, that made a, a tremendous difference in my horses just right away. I was cowboying at the time and, and I kept cowboying for a number of years after that. I, I left the sixes and, and went on up in the panhandle. And I, I run a couple different outfits up there. And, and so it was uh, the late 90s, I guess, where I, I was running the ranch and, and uh, the owners split up, kind of run out of a job all of a sudden. And so we moved back down between Benjamin and Guthrie there where we knew a few more, a few more people. And, and I was just going to day work and ride some horses till, I, till we could find another job, you know, a good job. Just save having to take the first $800 a month camp job to come along. But anyway, it's the first time in my life I'd ever had any time to do anything. I'd always had a job ever since I was a kid. I always worked for someone else, you know. And so I had a little time there. And, and uh, was riding some horses for the public, and, and first one person and another got to call in asking for a little help, and you know we kind of helped them out. And then a couple of those ranches, the, the Pitchfork Ranch and, and the Morehouse Ranch, uh, asked me to come and help the cowboys start their colts, you know. And, and so one thing led to another, and the word kind of got out that I was helping some people, and uh, I just never have found another job. I, I like to. Uh, and I always tell people uh, when, when I get there that I didn't come or Cheryl and I are not trying to show them how to ride their horse. All I want to do is show some things that I've learned through the years that have helped me help my horses. Now, mm -hmm. if you can use that, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you can't, that's all right too. That's up to you. So all I can do is, is present the information I have to the best of my ability, and I, I really think a lot and work a lot at explaining what I'm seeing with the horse in terms that anyone can can understand. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I feel like I have to adjust as a teacher. I should be, if I'm going, if I know the subject matter, I should be able to say something some way so it's understandable to anyone watching. And that's why I told him the other day. A lot of times Cheryl maybe is better explaining some of those things than I am because she uses different words or she relates different, especially to the ladies, seems like. But you get someone that seems like they're, they're not interested and, and they're riding around, you see them having a little trouble. So a lot of times I'll ask, well, how's that working out for you? You, know, you need some help? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't get along all right. I say, okay, just keep riding because I'm, you can't force anyone to learn something. I read a deal one time, it said, uh, knowledge cannot be pushed into the brain, it has to be pulled in. Mm -hmm. So until a person opens up enough to receive what's coming, 
you can't help them much, you know. But I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say I just quit on that person. I'll keep presenting that information and I, I may say some things to them that, you know, sometimes maybe it hurts their feelings a little bit. But it's a fact and the horse proves it. So I'm not, I'm not just blowing smoke at them. I said, there it is. The horse just showed you. Now, you can take my word for it or not, but the horse just showed you that's, that's true. Want to believe it today? That's fine. You don't? That's all right, too. So maybe you plant a seed there so that later on that brace kind of starts to work out of there on their own. Maybe they're going to have enough trouble. They want some help somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, no, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. I found that to be very true. And she, she mentioned men seem like especially have a little trouble there. I think uh, anyway. pride gets in the way there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I found, and I found this from my own experience because I told you I was pretty skeptical of Ray when I first heard of him. Uh, until a person admits to themselves that the way I've been doing things can be improved upon, it's pretty hard to get much better. And I didn't say the way you've been doing things is wrong. I'm saying the way you've been doing things could be improved upon, could be better. Once you'll admit that to yourself, then you open your, yourself up to some new information, some new ways of doing things. And so, and I, I've got some friends that met Ray about the same time I did that it just didn't take, it didn't fit them, or they didn't think they needed it or whatever. So they're still having the same trouble we was having 30 years ago. You know. It's up to them. You can wrestle and fight with one or you can kind of get along with him. You know. But there's no way to, they had the opportunity to learn but they didn't choose to accept that for whatever reason. Probably because it required them to change. Mm -hmm. Instead of just forcing the horse to change and force him to submit, the person has to change. That's what I was talking the other day, where we'd all like to have our horses soft and light and responsive and respectful and willing. All that's got to start in here and be offered to the horse in a manner he can understand it so that he can give it back a hundred times over. Ray always said if the human could just learn to give 5%, the horse would come up with the other 95%. And I see that to be true over and over and over. It's amazing what the horse can come up with and just give him a chance. Just a little, little offer there. You're not trying to force this down his throat you just saying, here, this, this would work for you if you just try it. You get him to try and, oh, he said, like this. Yeah, pretty quick. My, so I can do that. Here, let me help you. Then it really gets to getting better.